Hello, everyone. Um, good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight for the first edition of our virtual Ocean Cafe series. Um, we are able to offer these talks for free, thanks to the generosity of our many supporters, and could not do it without them. So a big thank you to all of them. And if it is within your means, we ask that you too can um, contribute to OPAC in our mission of empowering the, the next generation of ocean heroes. Tonight's talk is live here on Zoom and will also be broadcast to our Facebook channel. Um, we are also recording this video so that we can post it on our YouTube channel as well. Um, make sure that you do like our Facebook page, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you are the first one to know about our future OPAC events. And uh, we ask that you please keep yourself muted throughout tonight's presentation. Um, if you have any questions during the talk, please use the chat function on Zoom or the comment section on Facebook. There will also be time for questions at the end of our guest presentation this evening. With that, I am very pleased to introduce Chris Bowser. Uh, Bowser is the Education Coordinator at the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation's Hudson River Estuary Program and Hudson River National Estuarine Research Reserve, which also partners with the Cornell University Water Resource Institute. Uh, this team implements citizen science programs like the EEL Project and student initiatives like the Day in the Life of the Hudson River. Bowser's other experiences include um, serving as a reforestation volunteer with the uh, Peace Corps in West Africa, um, working as the education director for the Hudson River Sub Clearwater and teaching environmental science at Marist and Bard Colleges. Bowser also sits on the board of directors of Ocean Protection at the Kissy Kits, and we are so happy he could join us tonight to speak about one of his favorite topics, eels. And with that, I will pass the stage over to Bowser himself. Well, thank you, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, give me a big thumbs up if you can hear me okay. You too, Marie, I can see your face. All right, excellent. Hey, everybody, my name is Chris Bowser. Everybody calls me Bowser, and that's totally fine. And um, thank you to Ocean Protection Advocacy Kids for having me today. Uh, I'm really excited to talk to you about one of my favorite animals on the planet. And um, I love the idea of biophilia. I love the idea that people love nature. People, even in tough, challenging times like this, right? I have seen kids get totally excited over three mummachogs in the Morris Canal in New Jersey. That's right, it can happen. It doesn't take much to get excited, and that's something that animals do. But once in a while, we find an animal that goes from mere cool to something absolutely mystical. And that, my friend, is what we have when we start talking about the eel. That's right. This right here, here is a beautiful American eel for you to see. This is the, this is the real guest tonight. I'm just the ambassador of the eel. This is the actual animal that is something to be just, just honored and respected and loved. And so hopefully by the end of tonight, if you're not an eel lover, you will be. All right, I'm gonna try and do the good old screen sharing debacle thing. Let's see how that goes. Hopefully it'll go fine. Uh, let me see. Da, 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 da. So first question, Jeffrey, can you see can you see a nice big eel logo that looks like this? All right, terrific. So everybody, tonight I'm gonna to be talking about the Hudson River Eel Project. And I know you may not be along the Hudson River. We'll get to that, I promise. But the blue part of the talk is more important and that's fish conservation through community science. That's right, what can all of us do to have a role in studying, conserving, and falling in love with cool, weird fish that live all around us. This is an animal that isn't just something you're gonna see on the Discovery Channel or on, on Disney Plus. This is an animal that is probably living within a mile of you right now. And I don't even know where you live, but I know an eel lives near you. So let's keep going. So in the next 35 minutes, in the next 25 minutes, Jeffrey, just to make sure we have time for questions, 
We're going to go over the who's and the what's and the where's and the why's of the EO project. We're going to talk about some of the data that we found for all of you sciencey, geeky people out there. And you know who you are. We're going to also talk about people progress, how communities, students, anybody can get involved in eel science. And we're also going to talk just briefly about how we dealt with the eel project in 2020, which, as many of you know, is an extra challenging year in many, many ways. So we got a lot to get through. I'm going to rock it through stuff. So my advice is, if you have a question, if you have a comment, if you have a concern, put it in the chat box. Use that as a place to capture your thoughts. And I promise that Melanie or Jeffrey or I will get to those questions best we can. So use that chat box, put them right in there. We'll get to them, okay. So the American eel, Anguilla rostrata. Uh, this animal belongs to a family of fish called freshwater eels, or the sciency name for that would be catadromous eels. These are animals that spend part of their time in salt water and part of their time in fresh water. They have a really cool life cycle where they get to shift between the two. There's about 20 species around the world that have this life cycle, not just the American eel, but the European eel, and the Japanese eel, and the giant mottled eel, all sorts of cool animals that have this neat lifestyle. For our American eel, their lives start a thousand miles from New Jersey in a place called the Sargasso Sea. If you drew a triangle from Miami to Bermuda to Puerto Rico, you would have something called the Bermuda Triangle. And overlapping with that Bermuda Triangle is the Sargasso Sea. To the best of our knowledge, because no one's ever seen it happen, eels hatch here. Why do we know that? Because these cool, weird, little willow-shaped leptocephali are found there. They're baby eels, and they're drifting on big currents like the Gulf Stream, riding towards the East Coast. And when they get to the East Coast, some of them peel off into, into rivers in Florida and Georgia. Some of them peel off into Chesapeake Bay. Some of them peel off into Raritan Bay. And some of them keep going to Maine and Canada and beyond. But when they get here, they'll stay here for a few years, growing bigger and bigger and bigger. But they're not always big. Sometimes they're small. Here's a couple of eels in here, but they're hiding in the gravel. I don't know if you can see them right now. These are called elvers. And these are eels that have been in the Hudson for just a year or two. So these eels right here are probably one and a half to two years old. They'll stay here for five, 10, 20 years until they become what's called a silver eel. Their eyes get large. Their bodies change from being a freshwater animal back to a saltwater adapted creature with a dark top and a light bottom. These silver eels return back to the Sargasso Sea, spawn once, and die. It is an amazing two or 3,000 mile journey that they do once in their life, and we still don't completely understand why, or where, or when. If you're out there thinking about a career in marine biology, let me tell you something. Go with the eel, because the person who solves the question of eels, whoop, the lights went out right here. The person who solves the question of eels is gonna travel all over the world and be super famous in all of the nerdy publications that you want to be. Now, the sad part of the story is, though, that eel numbers have been going down across the world for the last 20, 30, 50 years. In the chat box, you right now listening, all right? Get up, stretch out, put in the chat box a guess. Why have eel numbers been going down in the last 40 years. Put it in the chat box. I want to see what people have to say. All right. What are your guesses? Why have eels, eel numbers, been going down? Oh, Hugo, overfishing. I like the way you're thinking. And in fact, that is one of the factors. Oh, look at Doug. Loss of habitat. 
That's right, we've taken a lot of great eel habitat and we've turned it into towns, right? Sometimes we need to do that and houses for us. Sometimes we don't always turn that into the best things. Uh, global warming. Louisa, I like the way you're thinking. If we change ocean temperatures, that's gonna affect eels too. In fact, John, you just nailed it with the whole water temperature piece of that. Uh, uh, Sean and Kirsten are on the ball with talking about pollution. That includes like toxic pollution, but even things like microplastics and things that we, we may not have thought about much the last few years, but now we're really starting to think more about it. And Marie Marie, barriers to migration. And what she's talking about are things like dams. When you have an animal that's trying to go from salt water to fresh water and up into a little creek, if you put a dam on that creek, that's gonna cut off that habitat. Well, who was right? Was it Doug? Was it Marie? Was it Louisa? Guess what? The answer is all of the above. There's no one reason why eels are in decline. There's lots of little reason eels are in decline. So what are we gonna do about it? That's kind of uh, 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 almost the bigger question to have, right? So it turns out eels are actually kind of hard to study. When their baby's out in the ocean, they're tiny and hard to find. By the time they're adults, they're so spread out through the watershed, through the valleys and towns and creeks, they're not that easy to find. But each spring, we have something amazing happen in New York and New Jersey, and it's the arrival of the glass eels. You see my hand there? And if you look closely, they're almost transparent, but you'll see some little poppy seed eyes and maybe a little spinal cord and maybe a little brain and some gills and some guts if you look closely. These are baby eels that are transitioning from salt water to fresh water. They're what we call, nickname, glass eels. They're still American eels, but at this size, they're called glass eels. And this is when they're bunched up the most. As they gather from the ocean, they bunch up in our coastal waters and then they spread out through the watershed. So the best place to find them are in our estuaries. Now you may be thinking to yourself, wait, an estuary? What the heck is an estuary? That might be a new word. Basically, an estuary is where a river meets the sea. It's where fresh and salt water mix and mingle, often with the tides, usually with the ocean. It's a very dynamic and interesting place. It's also a place where humans like to live, right? Look at this map. Maybe some of you live along Sandy Hook Bay or the Navasink River or the Raritan River. Go Rutgers, my alma mater, on the banks of the Raritan. Some of you may live in New York City or New Jersey or the banks or watersheds around the Hudson River. So the good news is, most of those places that I just described are part of an estuary where fresh water and salt water meet and mingle. And this is a great place to find those glass eels. Because if you look at this map, when those eels come in from the Atlantic Ocean, some of them might take a, a left turn and go into Raritan Bay or Sandy Hook Bay. Some of them might take a right turn and end up in New York Harbor and even way up the Hudson River. And I'm, I'm, I'm way up the Hudson River right now, by the way. I'm near a, a little city called Poughkeepsie, New York. So estuaries are wonderful places to see eels. So in order to kind of get the vital signs of eels, what we've done is at about 15 sites along the Hudson River estuary, we've put in these weird V-shaped nets right here. This is called a fike net. And every day, volunteers, volunteers like Marie Roche, by the way, go out and check these nets to see how many of these glass eels have come in throughout the night, because they like to travel under dark, dark nights. Some days we check these nets and there are zero eels in the nets. Some days we check these nets and there are hundreds of eels. And sometimes we check the nets and there's thousands of glass eels. And every time we go out, whether it's a zero or a hundred or a thousand, it's helping fill in the mystery of eels. And we do this 
all up and down the Hudson River with all sorts of volunteers. Some of them are high school students, some of them are watershed groups, some of them are retirees, some of them are families that like to come out, different social groups. We love to have a project that anybody can contribute in. And that's the great thing about eels. They don't just live in suburban streams or rural streams or urban streams. They live in every stream. You have eels near you. So notice the title of this slide is Eel Project Site Spring 2019. That's because we had a weird year 2020. In 2020, however, kudos to all those sites that are in red here that did maintain data sets safely and properly throughout the spring of 2020. But really what I just want this slide to show you is that across the entire Hudson River estuary, we have a whole bunch of sites, salty sites in Staten Island and Yonkers, brackish sites and freshwater sites all the way up to Albany and Troy. So what have we found? We go out every year, we catch and count these eels and lo and behold, if you look at this data real quick, from 2008 to 2019, it looks like the eel numbers went up. But wait a second. Remember, we started in 2008, but we added sites. So scientifically, it's better to look at the average number of eels we caught every year. And this is the average eels caught per day since 2008. Now, somebody in the chat box, tell me if you were looking at this, how, what would you say the trend of eels from 2008 to 2019? Are eels on the comeback? Are eels on the decline? Are eels just maintaining? Or somewhere in the middle? What do you, what do you think, all right? There's probably a couple guesses out there. And in fact, I think that what we see here is a bumpy increase over time. Remember, this isn't a laboratory experiment where you can control the variables. This is real science in the field. And real science in the field is bumpy and muddy and messy. And so is our data set. But if you look at it, you can see over time, I think we're seeing a comeback of eels in the Hudson River. And it's not just because we're getting better at catching them. We're using the same protocols and seeing more and more eels every year. We can even take that information and do things like we've been able to try and predict when eels start to come in based on water temperature. That's some of the kind of deeper dive of science that allows us to help predict when to put our nets out there. It's kind of a cool data set. We could, we could talk about data forever and ever and ever. I got graphs up the wazoo. But I also want to talk about some of the other aspects of the project that we do. For example, we mentioned the dams and the culverts, the pipes that water sometimes go through. What we have found is when we sample for eels below a dam and above a dam, we find that above a dam, we see fewer eels, but bigger eels. Because very few eels are making it over the dam, the ones that do get really, really big. But that means that a lot of eels don't have access to that habitat. So to try and help with that, We've done things like put in elevators. These are weird eel ladders that catch baby eels that go up this little ramp here and then volunteers take those baby eels and release them above dams, just like we see in this picture here. We found that when we do that, um, we often find that the type of eel that most loves to climb is that little elver that I showed you earlier. This right here is our climbing eel. This is the size of eel that loves to climb, these little elvers. They're super duper climbers. And I know you're thinking, wait, fish can climb? And the answer is yeah, as long as eels stay wet. They can diffuse oxygen through their skin, they can climb up waterfalls, go across lawns. If it's a damp, rainy night, you never know what you're gonna find. The biggest eel I ever saw was 42 inches long, wiggling down my driveway on its way to the Hudson River. No kidding. Whose driveway? This guy. <laughs> so, 
there's so many questions this kind of data can answer. There's so much, so many little stories we can go into, but it's also important to remember that this is also about the people that are involved in this project. And one of the things that makes EEL so great for community science is we have so many partners involved. It has this ooh factor of some people look at eels and go, ooh, that's gross. And then once you hold the little baby glass eel in your hand, like these girls are doing, that ooh turns to ooh, and it's a beautiful rainbow comes out, a unicorn flies by. It's an amazing thing when you hold a little baby eel and you realize that little baby eel traveled a thousand miles from the Bermuda Triangle just to say hello to you. Make sure to put it back, please. Thank you. Wide range of habitats means a wide range of volunteers. No matter where you live, no matter where you're, where, you know, age and everything else, you can be an eel volunteer. It's a limited sampling season. We're not asking volunteers to go out forever, just a couple months in the spring. There's a lot of data to collect. There's eels to see, and we keep the methods and the feedback clear and the communication going. So coming out and helping with eels is a fantastic thing. In our case, we start our project in the spring with having volunteers come in and help mend nets. We're, we're, we're recruiting volunteers in classrooms and community groups. We're doing mapping projects with students that get them involved in math and science before we've even put a net in the water. Then it's springtime and we are into it. We've got our nets in the water, our waders on, and the volunteers are going out and collecting eels for eight to 10 weeks. Once we're, and, and while they're doing it, we've got data sheets and, and all of the tools that it's need to figure out, is this a glass eel, is this an elver? How do I weigh them? All those questions get answered. When we're done with that, it's time to compile our data, it's time to figure out our results, but most importantly, it's time to have an elaboration. That's right celebrate our progress, have fun with t-shirts and pizza and science. It's just an awesome, awesome way to get in touch with the river. And the best thing is, as soon as the project's done for the spring, it's not done because somewhere out in the Sargasso Sea, hundreds of miles away, when we hang up our waders, it doesn't matter because the next batch of baby eels are on their way. <laughs> That's what I love most is knowing that that's coming. We've talked to people about why they volunteer. What we found out is that the real reason most people volunteer to do something is that it feels good for them. Yes, they want to clean up the environment and help the eels and make the river beautiful, but what people really value is spending time outside, being with their friends, connecting personally with nature. So that's how we always try to, to put science forward. Science isn't just about data, it's about the values, the importance that these experiences have to you as a person, you and your friends and your family. We try to make lots of, we have lots of students that get involved in different ways. Marie and others work with some great students that, uh, that often turn these into science projects. We had one student that was interested in art. And she, she drew not one, but two volumes of a comic book about the EEL project. That is just absolutely fabulous. Um, we have lots of college interns that help us out, that, that turn these into, into science projects that may catapult them to further careers in environmental issues. Um, and, um, um, you know, just wrapping up the, 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 the basic thoughts is something that I really try to emphasize to people, whether you're a teacher or a scientist or, or, or anybody, students and volunteers, even if you're not a trained scientist, you can collect legitimate valid data. You can be a community scientist. The entry ex expertise bar is low. You don't need to have fancy degrees to go out and help out with the EEL project, but the knowledge and the experience you gain will be super duper high. And lastly, I think that community science like this is vital to building our next generation of community leaders, not just scientists, but voters, business owners, family members, decision makers in all of our society, in all of our towns, in all of our, our communities. This is a great way to get involved. All right. So 
Super last, I just wanted to briefly mention that in 2020, we kept the EEL project going. We did it safely, fewer volunteers, more masks, more took it taking our time. But what was amazing was we have never seen as many eels as we did this year. We, we had so a huge number of eels. We had quite literally three to 400,000 eels caught this year. It was insane. Um, there were days where we didn't catch a thousand eels a day where we were catching five or six or 10,000 eels a day. I don't know what was going on this year, but it was a big, big year for eels and we kept it safe. Okay, we're gonna open up for questions. And while I'm open up for questions, I'm just gonna leave this out up here because this is a good slide of additional resources. You wanna hear more about the Hudson River Eel Project? That's the top link. If you wanna hear about the, that whole eel story that I kind of quickly went through, I made a big picture book and I narrated the story. I'm just sitting on a hill overlooking the Hudson River and you can hear about that story of the eel. And if you're really into podcasts, there's a super podcast called Radio Lab. And uh, last year, they did an episode called Silky Love. And if you wanna take a deep dive into the mysterious migrations of the eel, Silky Love is your path. So, Jeffrey, I've talked a lot. Are there any questions that you wanna pick out to have me answer? And by the way, I do wanna reserve two minutes uh, of my time for a very special presentation to wrap up with, just to let you know. So make sure to give me two or three minutes at the end. Yeah, we are looking forward to that wrap up. Um, I already did see a few questions come into the chat, so I will let um, everyone else ask their questions first. That's okay with you. Sure, sure, sure. So I've got, well, here's, I'm looking at this right now. So first of all, Hugo, I could try to volunteer for Ottawa. Is that like Ottawa, Ottawa, Canada? You could absolutely get involved with eels in Canada. In fact, Canada is, um, has, has done some fantastic work. The National Parks in Canada is really interested in eels. I've talked to people in parks there. Um, I'm, I'm actually working pretty closely with a, 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 a researcher from the First Nations there who is studying the intersection of eels and how indigenous ways of thinking about eels can actually augment conservation of eels. And so bridging all of these different voices together, eels are pretty hot in Canada. You're in a, you're in a great place for that. So absolutely you can volunteer in there. Um, all right, There's a couple other questions. Uh, could the rising temps in the ocean be helping the eels? Now, Kirsten, you bring up a really good point. A lot of times when we think about climate change or any environmental problem, we like to think of good or bad. And in fact, it doesn't really work that way. Change is change. Adapting to those changes can be easy or difficult, but it's, it's kind of, it's not always a good thing to label things as easy as good or bad. It's possible that climate change probably won't help eels, but it may shift their range. It may shift, you know, are there more eels in the southern states than in the northern states or vice versa? It may shift the timing of those eels. And when these things shift slowly, the whole ecosystem has time to adapt. That's really what has gone on for eels over 70 million years. But what we're seeing now is a pace of change that is very rapid and we really can't predict which species and their interlocking parts of the ecosystem are going to change together and where are we gonna see changes that grind like gears grinding together and they don't move because it's so fast. So. You ask a great question. I don't have an answer, but I do know that projects like this are part of building a set and building a bunch of people that are concerned that are helping to answer those questions. I know that sounded like I was kind of like not answering your question. That's 
That's that's a part of science, I have to say. <laughs> All right. I live in St. Paul, Minnesota, close to the Mississippi River. Are there eels in Mississippi? Minnesota is so far away. And yet, you bet your buttons there are eels in Minnesota because the Mississippi River drains that watershed, drains all the way to the Gulf of Mexico and eels that hatch in the Sargasso Sea make their way on the Bahamian current. They go between Florida and Cuba and make it into the, into the Gulf of Mexico and have been found up the Mississippi, including the state of Minnesota. Lucky you, Louisa. Louisa, write down my email address. It's on here and make sure to send me a picture of your first Mississippi eel. I want to see that animal. Cool. Is there a specific word for the study of eels? You know, this question came up today because somebody was saying like, oh, wow, wouldn't it be great if, if, uh, if, if we could go on the, the Ologies podcast and talk about eels? So I think that I'm gonna propose that uh, one potential word for the study of eels is actually on this slide right here. The genus name for eels is Anguilla, which just sort of means eely. So I like to think of somebody who studies eels as an anguillologist. So I'm gonna consider myself a budding, aspiring anguillologist. <laughs> there you go. Okay, let's see what, oh my gosh, there's a lot going on here. Have you, oh, John Lohman, here's a nice data question. Have you made any correlation between the yearly populations and some environmental factor? Is the graph just for the Hudson or the entire East Coast? So John, I'm gonna work backwards. Our data is just for the Hudson River. However, ready for a mouthful? If you go online and you look up the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, you are gonna go down a rabbit hole of eel data, the likes of which you have never seen, that spans the East Coast from Florida to Maine. And yes, they have got reams and reams of eel reports and eel data. In our case, the Hudson, which I'm most familiar with, um, I think we're seeing that trend over time of eels on the rise. I have not put that into an environmental factor yet. It could be something to do with temperature because that has also been seen a steady rise, but it could also be a conservation result of maybe eels are on the comeback trail. I will tell you that within that data set, when you dive deeper, we see a, a lot of correlations with water temperature and with stream flow, that amount of water, the spring freshet, the rain and snow melt that's coming out also affects eel numbers a lot. But again, that's getting at sort of the meso level of, 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 of eel stuff. So John, you mentioned that is associated with NOAA. The Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Association, I'd say that, I'd say that yes, they're definitely talking to NOAA, though, though, though they are their own uh, organization unto themselves. Kirsten, are there any good books about eels and their natural history you might recommend? Oh my gosh, I could go on forever. So I'll just tell you a couple. Um, I wish I had them on hand. I should have brought them out. A uh, good friend of mine, James Prosek, he wrote a great book. It's called Eels, <laughs> go figure. And then like Mysterious Migrants and the whole long thing from there. I really love that book. He, 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 come, he travels around the world talking about those other anguillid species that I hinted at earlier, but he always brings it back to the eels of the Northeast, like New Jersey and New York and Connecticut. Um, I, I, I love that book. Um, there's also a great book by an author named Bostock that's great for kids. Oh, it's called, um, uh, I think it's called Consider the Eel. I'd have to look it up. But again, the, the, the author's is, is Bostwick, Bostwick, I think. And um, it's, it's, it's a beautiful illustrated uh, kids book about the eel life cycle. That is, is absolutely one of my favorite favorites to read. Uh, and those eel comics, we actually have those posted on our website. So if you go on to that DEC website I gave you, you can, look, you can actually look at Bella's eel comics there. Uh, and you'll see they're pretty awesome. Um, so by all means. And then um, 
I'm going to say, Jeffrey, we've got time for your one last question here before our sign off. What do you think? Yeah, perfect. And that is going to be what are this is from uh, Mr. Jeffrey Morgan himself. What are some of the biggest misconceptions you get from students about eels? <laughs> well, there's a couple of them. I'm going to leave the best for last. First of all, that they're dangerous, that they're going to bite you. I've never been bitten by an eel, except for a trained eel, not a trained, but an acclimated eel we kept in captivity that would literally eat food out of our fingers. And it wasn't biting us, it was just trying to get to the food and mistook a fingertip for a, for a, for a dead fish. Um, so they're not dangerous. Um, a lot of people, the super common misconception is that they're electric. You know, people will look at an eel and be like, oh my gosh, this is an electric eel. So let's find out right now. So here's an eel in our tank, okay? Here's Bowser. I am touching this eel. That's right. I am not being electrocuted right now. So I can tell you from very personal experience that eels are not electric. Electric eels do exist. They're not particularly closely related to our eels. And electric eels live only in freshwater rivers in tropical South America. So being that, that we're talking in this case about an animal that lives along the East Coast in more temperate zones, you do not have to worry about being shocked by an electric eel. In Minnesota, in New Jersey, or in Canada, electric eels are not an issue. All right, we got a couple more. Oh my gosh, electric eels are not eels. They are knife fish. There you go. So Hugo is, 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 is right on the ball when it comes to eels. Now, I want, it bef I want to wrap up, but before I do, I just want to say one more huge thanks to Jeffrey and Melanie and OPAC, an organization that I think is fantastic. And I hope that everybody continues to, 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 to come together like this and all the other great talks that you started with. I hope that everybody out there, wherever you are, whatever watershed you are, find a creek near you and find out what lives in it. If it's eels, great. If it's not eels, you're still gonna find some really cool stuff. Get out there and explore. Um, one of the other things that we like to do with our programs is not just have science, but we love to talk about art as well. We love to talk about comic books and paintings and music and dance. And luckily, um, we also like to sing about eels once in a while. Now, some of you may be familiar with the song, uh, This Land is Your Land. This land is your land, da, da, da. Well, we're not gonna sing that tonight, but we are gonna sing a similar song called This Eel is Your Eel. Now, I've been singing this song for years. And just today I said, you know what? I've got to write a New Jersey version for my friends, Jeffrey and Melanie. So I hope everybody sings along with me on the chorus, and then I'll sing some little lines in between to tell a little story, and then the chorus will come back, and nobody out there has any excuse because you know the tune to this land is your land. I know you do. Even Hugo in Canada might know this one. This eel is your eel, this eel is our eel. From the Sargasso to the Raritan River, from the Atlantic Highlands to Sandy Hook Bay. These eels depend on you and me. Somewhere in the ocean, an eel is born. The water is salty, the water is warm. It takes a year or more for them to swim to shore. These eels are coming back to you and me. These eels are your eels. This eel is our eel. From the Sargasso to the Raritan River. From the Atlantic Highlands to Sandy Hook Bay. Just to let you know out there, a couple golden rules about singing that my buddy Pete Seeger taught me. First of all, your mouth has to be open. Second
secondly, sound has to come out. So Jeffrey, you're under pressure now. You're the only other face people can see. Jeffrey, when it comes back to the chorus, you're singing. Some call them classy, some call them nasty. But you and I know that heels are classy in all kinds of weather. We're gonna stick together. Keep these heels coming back to you and me. This heel is your real, this heel is our real. From the Sargasso to the Raritan River. From the Atlantic Highlands to Sandy Hook Bay. These eels depend on you and me. These eels depend on you and me. Nice work, everybody. Good job. Good job. Good job. All right. And with thank that, you so much. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I want to thank everybody for listening. Please keep exploring. Please keep finding out more. And please keep in touch with Ocean Protection Advocacy Kids. Thank you so much, Bowser, for joining us tonight. That was amazing. Um, and just so everybody knows, uh, we actually do have a few more of these talks coming up. Um, so I'm just going to pull up that for you so you can see what we have in the works. Um, so uh, in the next couple of weeks, we will be joined by Brian Kennedy, um, who used to work with NOAA out in the Pacific Islands. Uh, he is currently a PhD student at Boston University, and he is studying marine protected areas. Um, so he's going to join us and talk about his research on the Phoenix Islands marine protected areas and some of the cool critters he's found at those sites. That is next Monday, November 23rd at 7 p.m. And then on Thursday, December 3rd at 7 p.m., we will be joined by artist Mara Hazeltine, um, who is an amazing sculptor. Um, and she's going to share some of the great artwork she's done by taking microscopic marine organisms and blowing them up into macroscopic sculptures. So that is uh, going to be a great talk to learn a little bit about how we can all speak up for the ocean using different mediums of art. Um, so I hope you guys can join us for that. Uh, presentation as well. Um, and thank you for spending 45 minutes with us on a uh, Thursday night here on a, a pretty Zoom filled year. <laughs> um, and again, if you if you haven't, make sure you like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can uh, catch all of these talks if you can't make them in person. Um, and with that, I'll just give Bowser another round of applause and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Keep it eel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. We'll see you guys all soon.